but by writing to the chat part of the Zoom program. At the end of the presentation, your questions will be asked to the lecturer and will be discussed. Uh, mutual discuss discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meetings. Uh, and now I would I would like to introduce our dear guest. It is my privilege to introduce our lecturer, Professor Dr. Ashwin Viswanathan. Ashwin Viswanathan completed his undergraduate education at Massachusetts Institute of Technology between 1994 and 1998. He completed his medical school at the Bayer College of Medicine, Houston, Texas, between 1999 and 2003. He completed his res residency in general surgery and neurosurgery departments at the, at the Bayer College of Medicine between 2003 and 2009. After residency, he attended fellowship program in stereotactic and functional neurosurgery in 2009 at Oregon Health and Science, Science University. He has studied as assistant professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Baylor College of Medicine between 2010 and 2018. He is also director of stereotactic and functional neurosurgery at the same department uh, since 2010. In 2018, he became associate professor in Baylor College of Medicine. And since 2020, he has been studying as professor at the same cl clinic. He has many awards. Uh, since 2017, he is medical director of Department of Neurosurgery uh, of Baylor College of, College of Medicine. And also since 2020, he is the, he is the chief at the neurosurgical service of Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. Uh, his research interests are spinal cord pain transmission, uh, neurophysiology of the basal ganglia, neurostimulation for pain, and uh, also random, randomized controlled surgical pain trials. Professor Viswanathan has a pending research support about novel stimulation patterns to improve the effectiveness of spinal cord stimulation. He is recommended for funding by NINDS Council. He has active research support, support about percutaneous cordotomy for pain pal palliation in advanced cancer, uh, and also adaptive DBS in non-motor neuropsychiatric neuro disorders, regulating limbic circuit imbalance, imbalance and about uh, binocular and also uh, he has a active resource support about binocular coordination of eye movements. Professor Viswanathan is pain section editor of the Operative Neurosurgery Journal. Uh, he is also editor for Neurosurgical Focus Journal. Mr. Viswanathan is an elected member of American Society of Stereotactic and Functional Neurosurgery, and also elected member of America, American Association of Neurological Surgeons. Professor Viswanathan, uh, we are very glad to host you in our online conference today. Welcome again. Uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it really is a uh, honor to come share with you all today uh, what I have learned about cordotomy. Um, you know, it really is something that, uh, you know, the international community has come together to really move forward. And, um, you know, the work that was done in Turkey has been, uh, you know, the most important in terms of understanding and and sharing the information on cordotomy. So it is particularly nice to come today and it is nice to see uh, the experts in the audience that we have today. Um, so, you know, I do, I should acknowledge a little bit of funding I have uh, for the cordotomy research, but most importantly, I need to acknowledge the people that taught me this. Um, you know, as you shared, I did my training in Houston in the USA and also with, uh, Professor Kim Birchall, um, who taught me a lot about pain, but the two people that really taught me about this technique uh, is by reading the uh, works of uh, Professor Kampalot 
And then Ahmed Roslan. I don't know if you all know uh, Dr. Roslan, but he works in Oregon. And um, uh, he studied with uh, Professor Kampalat uh, maybe in 1999 or 2000. And uh, he was a key person that helped me. So, uh, you know, I'm very grateful. Interestingly, I was uh, telling my wife I was giving this talk today and she had visited your city, Izmir. So I hope one day I will have a chance to, uh, to come and, uh, and uh, meet you all in person and learn, uh, learn from you all as well. So, you know, I know you all have uh, expertise with chordotomy, but uh, hopefully I can share a little bit about, you know, what I have learned. I should say one other thing. I was always struck by uh, Dr. Kampalat gave a talk, you know, maybe in 2014. And, you know, he had, you know, taught us all this technique, but he shared that he is not an expert in chordotomy, but that he only had some experience with it. So, you know, I am very far from an expert on this topic. I do have a little bit of experience with it, but hopefully I can share a few details. So we'll talk a little bit about the background, the technique, maybe present some cases. And then I would love to uh, hear about your experiences. And if there is some discussion, uh, I would love that as well. So this is uh, from uh, Professor Kampalot's work. Um, chordotomy is a lesion of the spinal thalamic tract. And I think it is best used, uh, or what the studies have shown is that it's best used for patients that have cancer and mostly pain on one side of the body. The best candidate will be somebody that has a, a tumor that is causing the pain. So maybe a purely nociceptive pain condition, which is caused by some local tissue damage. Best below the C5 dermatome, as we generally perform percutaneous chordotomy at the C1, C2 level. And then we should exercise some caution in performing bilateral chordotomy. Though I see that, um, that you all have a, a very strong experience in doing, uh, you know, ha have done many patients with chordotomy on both sides of the body. I have only done that a couple of times, but I would love to hear about your experience with that as well. So the goal is to place the radio frequency electrode within the spinal thalamic tract. There are a few things that we should be aware of. One is the corticospinal tract, which is more posteriorly or dorsal. And the other critical structure to know about is the ventral reticulospinal tract. So this is the one where if you lesion it bilaterally, uh, one can have uh, central hypoventilation syndrome or Ondine's curse where they lose a spontaneous respiratory drive. But as I have read uh, some of your work and as uh, Dr. Roslan had also shared with me, if one uh, adjusts the location of the lesion on both sides, perhaps that's a safe way of going about it. There are two uh, main projections to the spinal thalamic tract. So we bring in both the A delta fibers, which transmit fast pain, sharp pain, as well as C fibers to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And they project differently, we think. So the A delta fibers uh, will project through VPL in the thalamus to cortical area 3B. And the C fibers, which may carry preferentially neuropathic pain, will transmit to VMPO, which is another nucleus within the thalamus, and then up to a different cortical area, area 3A. I think we are still learning a little bit about how the fibers of the spinal thalamic tract are oriented. There are different ideas about how they are oriented. Uh, some have suggested that sacral fibers are more posterior to lumbar fibers, which are behind the thoracic and the cervical. It may have been uh, uh, Dr. Kampalot that shared that maybe deep pain is deeper than temperature, which in turn is uh, deeper than superficial pain. Some animal studies have supported that 
the lamina one fibers of the dorsal horn travel more dorsally than the fibers from the deep dorsal horn. But the truth is probably a combination of all these things. Yes, we can adjust the radio frequency electrode in chordotomy. And if we go more posteriorly, yes, there's a chance you will get some lumbar fibers. But even if you put the electrode more dorsally, you can still get stimulation in the hand. So probably there's a variation in how the temperature and the deep vein fibers are segmented in the spinal thalamic tract. This is a very interesting study. I will just present a couple of studies you may be familiar with, but this is with a scientist uh, from a scientist named Apkarian. And he did some interesting studies in monkeys where he would lesion both ventrally and dorsally the spinal thalamic tract in a monkey in the thoracic spinal cord. And what he found is that ventral lesions or the lesions that were anteriorly did not take away all the projections of the spinal thalamic tract. And the meaning of this is that if we do an open thoracic chordotomy, which some people would do if they wanted to create bilateral spinal thalamic tract lesions, you may not take away all of the spinal thalamic tract fibers. So if somebody has continued pain after a thoracic chordotomy, it may be because all the fibers were not cut. But the brilliance of a CT guided chordotomy is that we really can lesion all of the fibers of the spinal thalamic tract. So these were some uh, studies that were done in 2000. And I think it was by Dr. Giesler and uh, maybe in Minnesota, USA. And he would do uh, recordings where he would stimulate the thalamus. He would also record in a, in a monkey, the dorsal horn and the lumbar spinal cord. And then he would look at the C2 level or at various levels of the spinal cord to see where those spinal thalamic tract axons were located. And he found things that were similar to what Apkarian found in his monkey study. So at T7, or in the middle of the thoracic spinal cord, you will see spinal thalamic tract axons, both anterior and posterior to the dentate ligament, or the midline of the spinal cord. But if you move up now to the C6 level in the cervical spinal cord, all the fibers of the spinal thalamic tract move anteriorly so that we can make a lesion in the upper cervical spinal cord and lesion all of the spinal thalamic tract. And so then if you go to C2, you can see that all the fibers of the spinal thalamic tract are anteriorly. And the other interesting thing is uh, you can see how the superficial dorsal horn and the deep dorsal horn are arranged. There is some mixture of these fibers within the spinal thalamic tract, but it is possible that the superficial dorsal horn is more posterior than the fibers of the deep dorsal horn. So that may be relevant in terms of lesioning the whole spinal thalamic tract. So we'll look now at the different techniques. Um, you know, the um, fluoroscopically or x-ray guided technique is the one that had been used for the longest time. And um, there is a lot of experience with it. I think it takes a lot of skill. I have never done it. So I think it requires a lot of experience and knowledge. The CT guided technique, on the other hand, is probably easier to learn because most of us are able to look at the image, a two-dimensional image, and we can adjust the needle very precisely. So I think it is easier for somebody starting to learn a CT guided technique. You know, uh, so, you know, I've practiced for a little bit. Uh, this would be my, uh, you know, 11th year of practice. 
I have only done a few open chordotomies. So I do not do this commonly. Um, so it's, you know, I think the CT guided technique or the percutaneous technique is better. I don't know how much experience there is with an anterior transdiscal chordotomy. I have not done it, but Dr. Roslan has published a series, as you may know, where he lesion, he has lesioned below the C2 level. So at C5 and C6. And the reason for considering this is if you wanted to avoid a bilateral lesion of the reticulospinal tract at the C1, C2 level. So this may be something to consider, but I will tell you that I don't think Dr. Roslan does this anymore. And it may be related to the fact that he is worried about an anterior spinal artery injury in doing this, but it is an option. Okay. Um, so the CT guided technique is uh, very nice. Um, we use um, CT guidance as Dr. Kampalat had suggested. And the goal is to go between the C1 and C2 levels um, in the spinal canal. And the rough points of entry would be one centimeter below and one centimeter posterior to the tip of the mastoid. It is pretty reliable, but in doing the CT guided technique, you really can precisely find the entry point, and this will help you get the spinal needle exactly where you want it to go. Now, I don't know if uh, this is uh, relevant for, you know, all parts of the world, or this is a, um, you know, strangeness of the American medical system. But in America, it is sometimes a consideration of where these procedures should be done because radiologists really own the diagnostic CAT scanners in the hospital and neurosurgeons or anesthesiologists are more comfortable doing or they have more ownership of doing procedures in the operating room. Also, when I started my practice, um, the neuroradiologist wanted to share the procedure where the radiologist would put the needle in and then I would put in the radio frequency electrode. I do not think this is a good idea. It is really best that one physician does this procedure. It doesn't matter what specialty is doing it, but whoever puts in the needle should also be the one doing the chordotomy and putting in the radio frequency electrode. So there are different places that you can do a chordotomy. You know, in places that have a CAT scanner in the operating room, this is an option. Uh, and there are different types of CAT scanners. You know, you have one where you move the table um, and then you also have one where the CAT scanner itself moves. Cone beam fluoroscopy is another uh, possible way of doing a chordotomy. So, um, these machines, as you know, can do three-dimensional reconstructions uh, and give reasonably good images. But I think uh, I have used all these methods, but my favorite is in the diagnostic CAT scanner. So in the radiology department where the CT machine is, I think it's the best one. And the reason for this is it is very fast to move a patient in and out of the CAT scan machine. Uh, you know, there are buttons here, you can move them out very quickly, adjust the needle and put the patient back in the scanner very quickly. With these machines here on the left, it is very difficult, I think, to, I shouldn't say difficult, but I don't, it is, it is more difficult to adjust the needle while the patient's head is inside the CAT scanner. So you can do it, but I don't think it is as uh, easy to be able to see how you're moving the needle and to adjust it properly. These are some images with the Medtronic O-arm. I think it is good, uh, but I still like the diagnostic scanner more. The advantage of the O-arm, as you know, is you can do x-rays in addition to the three-dimensional picture. So you can use some x-rays to see when you're going towards the midline. 
you can do some x-rays to make sure that the needle is going towards the C1, C2 level. And then you can get images like this. So as you'll see in a minute, you know, these images are not as good as a diagnostic CAT scanner, but it is okay. You can see the outline of the spinal cord here. You can see the radio frequency electrode in the spinal cord. So it may be good enough um, uh, for doing this procedure, but it is not my favorite. But you can see here in a diagnostic CAT scanner, what beautiful images you can obtain, especially when the myelogram is done. I will have to be honest, I am not an expert in doing myelograms. And when I do them, uh, you know, I don't always get uh, the greatest contrast in the spinal cord, in the, the around the spinal cord. So I have asked my rate, we have, um, you know, radiologists that will do the myelogram uh, under x-ray. And then after that, I will take the patient to a CT scan area. But doing the myelogram before the patient goes to the CAT scanner, I think is a really much better way of doing the procedure because you can see very clearly where the needle needs to go. This is actually not a bad CAT scan. You can see the, the, the spinal cord reasonably well here, but that's not always the case when you do a CAT scan without contrast. And you really wanna be able to precisely put this, this uh, spinal needle exactly where you want it. And that's best done when you have nice contrast there. Um, you can inject contrast at the C1, C2 level. Um, so this is a patient, uh, it was a child and for some reason we could not do the myelogram before. So you can place the needle in the dura and then you can see it. It does take some time for the contrast to mix. So it requires a little bit of patience after you inject the contrast to be able to see it. I would also say that, um, you know, uh, I've not had it happen, but I've heard that, you know, there is a one report where the contrast went inside the spinal cord. So if you are doing this technique of putting the needle in at the C1, C2 level, and then injecting contrast, I would be very sure and do a picture before you inject the contrast to ensure that the needle is outside the spinal cord. As you know, when you're doing these CT, when you're doing these procedures, the dura will poke it, will, will bend quite a bit. So uh, once you've gotten spinal fluid, the spinal needle will oftentimes be here rather than being right at the dural edge. So just something to keep in mind. It is not common, but it can happen. Um, so there are both disposable and non and reusable electrodes for cordotomy. Um, the ones that I have used, uh, these may have been the ones that uh, Professor Compilot used as well, uh, are the um, LCE or LCED electrodes. They were made by a company named uh, Cosman or uh, maybe even Radionics before. And it comes with a 20 gauge spinal needle. Um, and this is the exposed tip here of the electrode. And if you are new to the procedure, uh, which I know many of you are not, uh, but if you're new to it, it is important to put the radio frequency electrode into the spinal needle to see where the electrode starts to come out of the hub of the spinal needle. So there's a little bit of a yellow portion of the electrode here. Generally, when uh, the electrode is in the spinal cord, you know, this portion of the electrode will be at the white part here. It is very easy to push the electrode too far because it requires some force to put to penetrate the pia of the spinal cord. So having this little bit of a mark here can help you know how deep you are. Just uh, you know how the electrode looks uh, once it's in the patient. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I think it is very nice to identify exactly where you want the spinal needle to go in. I think a paper clip is a nice way to do it. Uh, there are other ways of marking, of course. 
I don't really tape the head anymore. Um, this was an image from some time back, but somehow you need the patient to be fairly stable. Um, but using the paper clip, which you can see here, you can tell that you need to be at this portion of the paper clip or so perhaps a touch more anteriorly to get a nice trajectory to the spinal cord. Um, I do all of these procedures with an anesthesiologist present. Um, I know uh, some others may have done this with just Versed and fentanyl, and that may be a very good way of doing it. Um, but if you do use an anesthesiologist and they use medicines like uh, propofol or uh, Presidex, you may want to minimize the use of sedation because some patients can wake up confused and the sedation used can be more problematic than just having done it under a little bit of sedation. Um, the other thing that, uh, as you know, it's not a very painful procedure. You know, the, uh, the, the times that you can get some pain are when you're going near the dura and you're poking into the dura, that can cause a little bit of pain, but usually not too bad. The other point is that putting the electrode into the pia of the spinal cord can hurt. So I would say that the, that that is another time that you just want to talk to the patient if they're awake and let them know you're going to feel some pain now. Please don't move. Maybe have uh, an assistant surgeon just rest their hand on their head to make sure the patient doesn't move when you insert the radio frequency electrode. Okay, so just some examples of some pictures. These are the pictures I had shown before with the paper clip here and here. Um, and you can see that I did not do a good job in this first uh, pass here. The spinal needle is very anterior. It is also too cranially. We are near the C1 level rather than at the C1, C2 level. So here I have adjusted it to be more caudal. So we have gone down, but you can see that I'm still very anterior, so not good. And things are getting a bit better now. So now you can see that my spinal needle is moving in the correct direction. And, you know, if you follow it on, we should have a good path to get in the anterior half of the spinal cord. And I like to do a picture uh, before we uh, put the spinal needle into the dura. You know, I think if we can get a, if you can get a really good picture here that shows that the spinal needle is going the right direction, it'll make the rest of the, pic the, the, the procedure much nicer. So now once the needle is inside the dura, the goal is to put the spinal needle just outside of the spinal cord. You don't really want the spinal needle to be here because then as you insert the radio frequency electrode, there's a lot of um, electrode outside here. Uh, so it's difficult to know, or it's hard to make some adjustments if it needs to be. So I think having the spinal uh, needle close to the spinal cord is very helpful. I think uh, also it is good to pay attention to the orientation of the bevel. I cannot see it here. I, I imagine that the bevel is angled like this, which means that if you're inserting it into the neck of the patient, the bevel is up. I think that is a good way to have it to begin. And I'll tell you why I think that's important uh, in a few moments. So um, different electrodes will measure different impedances. For the electrodes that I use, when the, spine, when the electrode is in the spinal fluid, generally the impedance will be around 200 ohms. When I go into the spinal cord, it'll be 700 ohms. Some people have published, and maybe uh, Professor Kompelot has published uh, more than 1,000 ohms. For whatever reason, the electrodes that I use don't go that high. Um, but nonetheless, the important thing is that as you are pushing, as you're in the spinal fluid, the impedance will be lower. As you push against the spinal cord, it'll slowly increase. So you'll see it go 300, 400. And then all of a sudden, when you pop in, 
you will get a impedance above 700, maybe seven to 800. And generally, as we discussed, uh, probably a good starting point is to be a little bit in front of the midline of the cord for lumbosacral pain, and to be a little bit more anteriorly for thoracic and cervical fibers. I think it is important to adjust, uh, I should not say the needle, I should say the radio frequency electrode to get the paresthesia that you're looking for or to be in the correct portion of the spinal cord. So this is a, a chordotomy and this here is anterior, this is posterior. Anterior, posterior. And by just a, the needle, the spinal needle, which is here, has not been taken out and readjusted, but by putting some gentle pressure on it, you can adjust the electrode to be more posteriorly or more anteriorly. So you take the electrode out, put a little bit of pressure on the spinal needle, and you can reinsert it. And then once you're within the cord, you can move in and out to try to adapt the stimulation to where the patient hurts. Um, I don't know if this is common practice uh, uh, with you all as well, but I generally you know, try to do more than one peel penetration to just make sure that I'm in the best spot. Um, so if I'm too anteriorly and I get uh, you know, hand stimulation, I might move it more posteriorly if I'm targeting hip pain. As you know, the beauty of radio frequency procedures is to be able to test a patient. So I've used two hertz stimulation with a 0.1 millisecond pulse width um, uh, to test for motor response. Um, so if you do not get motor responses at um, less than one volt, it is probably safe. Recently, I uh, met somebody that, you know, they turn it up to get motor response. So they'll stimulate up to two volts to actually see contractions of the hand. You know, I have not routinely done that, but maybe that's a good strategy also. Then we do sensory stimulation at 100 hertz, 0.1 millisecond pulse width. You know, as you know, this can be uncomfortable for the patient. So you know, you need to talk to the patient well and slowly turn it up. Generally, you'll get some sensations at 0.1 or 0.15 or maybe 0.2 volts. If you're going above 0.5, something may not be right. Um, that either means that the patient has tremendous uh, deafferentation or sensory loss or something is not technically working right, or the needle is not in the right place. This is from Dr. Roslan's work. He looked and saw and uh, looked to see where you would get uh, decreased pinprick sensation with a chordotomy. And he found that um, if 60% uh, you know, of patients would have uh, sensory loss uh, at the C5 dermatome, but, you know, some patients only got it at the C6 level. So if you are targeting pain up high, you may want to keep this in mind because if a patient doesn't benefit, you may not have gotten as high as you needed to. So in Dr. Roslan's series, uh, you know, he, um, and this is uh, very similar to what Dr. Kampalot had, had reported, um, you know, motor changes in motor strength is not common. No evidence of sleep apnea, but I don't think Dr. Roslan had done bilateral chordotomy. Um, he had some transient hypotension, transient headache, and then transient dysesthetic sensations in two patients. For me, I did have one patient that had some lower extremity weakness. It was short term, but this was also at a time, you know, as I was learning to do the procedure, there were cases where I had put the needle more posteriorly here um, because I had some patients that had persistent pain and I was trying to understand why. So I sometimes would make pretty dorsally placed lesions. So I think as long as you keep the needle anterior to the midpoint of the spinal cord, I think it is a safe procedure and it is unlikely to cause weakness. 
The main problem that uh, that can come up sometimes are these dysesthetic sensations. So if one is too aggressive or if I am too aggressive in lesioning the spinothalamic tract, patients can get some uncomfortable sensations. So I've had a couple of patients where the sensations have been long-term or bothersome phenomenon. You know, I didn't write down mirror pain, um, which I should have. I have had um, two patients that had mirror pain after cordotomy. You know, one was an extremely striking case. It was a young girl who had a large sarcoma of the thigh. And I lesioned the spinothalamic tract. And after the first lesion, she started to cry about pain in the left thigh. So the procedure was done for the right thigh. And then immediately after the lesion on the CAT scan table, she reported left thigh pain. So this can happen. Um, I've also had this happen with lung cancer where a patient had a tumor on one side of the chest and the day following the procedure, he was reporting left chest pain. So it's something to be aware of. Um, I would be curious to know from your experience whether you know why this happens and if it can be avoided, but I do not know. So I think that's an area to study. All right, so just a couple of uh, cases. Uh, you know, this is one of the first cases that I did, 35 year old woman with melanoma, had developed progressive left hip and leg pain. She was unable to walk. You can see the destructive lesion in the left hip and uh, so she underwent cordotomy. At the time, uh, I did uh, two permanent lesions at 70 degrees and at 80 degrees centigrade. Today, I largely use two lesions at 80 degrees centigrade. Um, and maybe I had some dysesthesia when I did, sometimes I was doing three lesions and maybe that is too much, but I think two lesions at 80 degrees Celsius is safe. So the patient did very well, uh, her pain resolved, she was coming off her pain medicine, but then she reported a headache, um, which uh, I think had been hidden by her right hip pain that she was having, her left hip pain that she was having. And so I got a CAT scan after surgery and an MRI and she had a large brain tumor. So I think it is probably wise in cancer patients to get a CT head before doing cordotomy, um, it is important to make sure that they do not have larger metastasis. Um, so just something to keep in mind. This is what the imaging after cordotomy looks like. These are T2 weighted MRIs. You can see the lesion in the spinal cord on the axial as well as the sagittal. Um, and then in a couple of weeks later, if you do an MRI, you'll see a nice enhancing lesion in the spinal cord. So just something as you're beginning, it may be useful. You know, these are patients that are uh, generally sick uh, towards the end of life. So it's not always easy to get MRI scans. So I try not to do it routinely, but occasionally it is good for education. In America, cordotomy is not used so commonly. Um, you know, some people, uh, pain doctors and palliative care doctors may say because they do a good job. People may think that there's a lot of risk for the procedure. Some people may say that you get dysesthesia or painful sensations in the longer term. And are there some patients that do well and some that don't? I don't know. So we did a study to understand, you know, in a cancer center, uh, you know, what is the role of cordotomy? So we designed a trial with our palliative care doctors. I should give some credit, a lot of credit to Dr. Eduardo Bruera, who is my palliative care partner, um, and because he's been very supportive of doing these studies. And so we did a randomized controlled crossover trial. So patients with one-sided cancer pain could participate. So we wanted them to have at least two follow-ups by the palliative care service to make sure that the palliative care doctors had done uh, you know, reasonable medical management and had done good use of morphine and other pain medicines. Um, 
a life expectancy greater than one month, but this is impossible to know. We did exclude patients with large brain masses or uncorrectable coagulopathy. You know, one thing I would say about chordotomy is it's unusual to find a patient that you cannot correct the, the, the coagulopathy. So, you know, if they have a high uh, PTT or PT, you can give some uh, FFP and make the procedure safe. We have given some platelets for patients that have very low platelet counts. Uh, I don't know what the safe cutoff is for chordotomy. I don't think I have ever done a chordotomy in a patient with a platelet count uh, less than 50,000. But I think I have done it in patients. I think there was one patient where the platelet count was 42,000. We transfused the patient some platelet and maybe it was around 50 or 55,000. So, you know, I think if you're, I would say generally maybe 75,000 is a, is a safe cutoff, but it could be done lower if there's the right indication and if the patient understands the risks. So for this study, this was our first study. We randomized patients. Some went to medical management. Some went to chordotomy. If the medical patients had continued pain, they could then undergo chordotomy. Um, and this was one of our first study patients. It was our first patient. So metastatic rectal cancer. Um, you know, for midline pain, you would do a myelotomy, not a chordotomy. But his pain was actually in the left uh, buttock due to some tumor. He couldn't sit. It was very painful. He underwent a chordotomy. This is what the lesion looked like after the procedure. And for this trial, we did these uh, tests with sharpness and with heat pain thresholds. You know, in the left buttock, you can see that he already had some numbness. So 128 grams is that these are the, the weights of the needles that we use. So this did not change because this is the heaviest weight that we use. But you can see the temperature in Celsius went up a lot. So his heat pain threshold before the chordotomy was 39.7. After the chordotomy, it was 49. So he lost heat pain uh, sensation. And he did very well along, uh, this is a brief pain inventory that we use for patients to assess their pain. We also use the Edmonton uh, symptom assessment scale that showed improvements. So, so these were the outcomes. In the patients that underwent chordotomy, there was a significant improvement. So the mean pain score, a median pain score before the procedure was nine. After the procedure, it was three. For the patients that underwent uh, medical treatment, there was no change. Um, so I think continuing medical treatment is not helpful. And this is how patients looked like in the longer term. Yes, there were two patients that had a recurrence of their pain, but most patients had good pain control until their death. We looked to see why patients may not uh, do well after chordotomy. Uh, and we tried to see if there was a relationship between what you saw on the MRI and how patients did. I could not find any correlation. Yes, we want the lesion in the right part of the spinal cord, but you know, I could not make any conclusions about what, you know, how this related to pain relief. One thing we did do though, is look at diffusion tensor imaging or DTI. And you can correlate, a DTI may be a, able, uh, may be a good way to look at the extent that the axons are, are disturbed. So patients that had greater changes in DTI metrics had more pain relief. And then you can see the sensory changes. So this is looking at heat pain in the bottom. This is looking at sharpness pain. And you can see that the, this, these are the weights of the needles. So these are the needles that we use. And before chordotomy, somebody would feel a 42 gram weight as painful or sharp. After the chordotomy, it required a 92 gram needle to feel the same sharpness. So they would have changes in their sharpness. They would also have changes in their uh, heat pain. So again, if you put uh, the, a heat um, electrode on their arm, um, their threshold would go up. 
Now, it's interesting in all parts of the body, the heat pain threshold would go up and then it would come down a little bit. So it may not be a long-term phenomenon for most patients. But many interventions have some sort of a placebo response. Um, I'm beginning to think that this does not exist in cancer patients, you know. I don't think that in patients dying from cancer, you all, well, I, I shouldn't say that, I, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, um, but uh, I, I, it is not common for a placebo response to exist with cancer pain, I think. But with that said, my partner, Dr. Bruera, had felt we should do a sham controlled trial. So a placebo controlled trial of chordotomy. So in this trial that we're doing, patients are randomized to either undergo chordotomy or to undergo a fake chordotomy. So for the real chordotomy, we put contrast and then we put the electrode in the spinal cord. For the fake chordotomy, we put in some morphine and then we put the needle outside the spinal cord and pretend like we're doing a chordotomy. There are some ethical questions about this, but um, you know, I personally struggle with this. Uh, we have a patient tomorrow that we're going to do the study for, and uh, he was randomized to the uh, fake chordotomy, which is, um, you know, it is troubling in a dying patient to believe that the chordotomy will help, and I'm doing this intervention here. But the goal is to give good quality data to say that this is helpful for patients. Same kind of inclusion criteria. So what are the key takeaways I would say? I would say this is a very safe procedure to do. You know, I, I have not hurt anyone in a serious way, even in sick cancer patients on various blood thinners and other things. So um, I think this is a safe strategy, the two lesions at 80 degrees Celsius for 60 seconds. I generally make the lesions in two different places. So either withdraw the radio frequency electrode a little bit to make the second lesion or change the anterior posterior part, part of the cord that you lesion. I do generally make more than one poke in the spinal cord. Um, and I think this is safe. Um, and I tell all patients, the goal of this procedure is to cause some sensory loss. But for most patients, it is uh, a fair trade-off if the pain gets better. So thank you so much for your attention. I would be happy to share my slides with you if they are helpful. Uh, I would love to hear about your experiences with chordotomy, uh, using the fluoroscopic or the x-ray techniques, bilateral chordotomy, but happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Professor Vaswiswanathan. Uh, it was a great conference, and for myself, I have learned a lot. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I have I have had some questions, but some of them you have uh, answered in the uh, presentation. Uh, but I uh, wonder uh, how is your preoperative preparation, and uh, how is your post-op uh, follow-up? Uh, what do you uh, care about uh, like that? Very good question. Thank you. Um, so the preoperative care is really making sure that uh, the blood, uh, they clot their blood okay. So I, I am careful with the blood thinners. I make sure that the platelet count is okay and the PT and PTT. Um, after the procedure, I have generally kept everybody overnight. I think maybe I have done one or two cases where the patient went home uh, the day of the chordotomy, but I have kept them mainly to watch their pain medicines and make sure that they're doing okay after the procedure. But I don't think that you, you know, unless somebody has a lot of lung dysfunction, I don't think you need pulse oximetry or telemetry or specialized care. I think just being in the hospital is enough. I also see a question from uh, Professor Suku. Um, so he asked, have I ever done a chordotomy without contrast injection? 
And I have not done it intentionally, but I actually, but I have done two cases like this. You know, one patient, um, I made a mistake and I did not know they had a severe contrast allergy. So we had scheduled the procedure and then I learned that the patient had a contrast allergy. So I did do cordotomy without it. And then there was one other patient, I don't know why. Oh, one other patient, I could not put contrast. For whatever reason, I could not get the needle into the lumbar spine for this patient. Uh, so, you know, it can be done. Um, you know, as I showed you on that other image, in some CAT scans, you can see the spinal cord pretty clearly, but it's not always the case. So I don't think it's as good, but I think if you have to, it can be done. Um, so I hope that answers the two questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uswanathan. Uh, I, I wonder the thoughts of uh, Professor Yegul. Can we turn on his microphone? It's he has a huge very... experience. Uh, thank you, Kami. Uh, I also thank Uswanathan uh, for his nice presentation. And uh, I want to know uh, what is his success rate of all your patients. And I think uh, mirror pain is uh, higher uh, percentage. Uh, I forgot my numbers, but I think uh, it's more than 50 patients, it occurs in a pain. But it's not a very big problem. Maybe very few of them uh, has very sharp pain, but uh, you can do both sides as, you, as he did in a bit bilateral so I did for many patients bilateral cordotomies, I think more than 70 uh, patients I did bilateral. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Um, I think my outcomes vary depending upon the nature of the pain the patient has. You know, when it is really purely nociceptive pain, so like this patient that had this tumor in the buttock or if they have a leg tumor, these patients, I think, very reliably improve. But I think, you know, cancer pain is uh, very complicated. You know, it is due to radiation. It is due to nerve involvement. Um, so in those patients, I would say that probably the success is, is, uh, is less. So if I look across all my series, if I look across all the patients, maybe I've treated a hundred patients now with cordotomy, I generally tell patients that 60 to 70% will have really a very meaningful improvement in their pain. Um, but for me, it has not been 100% uh, or 90%. It, it, there is some variability in this for me. And uh, how long uh, does it last the painless period? I think mine has been similar to what Dr. Roslan has reported. You know, in truth, for whatever reason, the referrals that I get for cordotomy are generally within three to six months of passing away, of death. So, you know, I don't have patients that have lived for one, few, few patients that have lived for one year or two years after cordotomy. But I would say that most uh, have had good pain relief for three to six months uh, until the time of death. There is some recurrence. So I would say maybe, you know, 20% of patients will have recurrence after three months or six months. You know, as you all have had, I've had some success with the repeat cordotomy particularly for mesothelioma or, uh, you know, uh, some other, uh, you know, when they did really well the first time, I think a repeat cordotomy can help. Um, but 
there is some recurrence, maybe 20%. Hmm. Okay. Yes, Professor Yagul, uh, do you have any other words? Uh, thank you. I, uh, I have many questions, but uh, it's not time, I think. Uh, maybe face to face talking uh, will be better. Uh, so uh, I want to, I, I'm retired. I'm not working uh, now, but uh, I have, I had many patients, I think uh, 549 patients wow. I, I did for Lutami. So uh, I had many experience uh, many uh, patients, for example, in one patient, uh, he had a right side uh, pain uh, due to lung cancer, uh, chest pain, shoulder and back pain. And so uh, I entered on the left side and stimulate, but the patient felt uh, the stimulation on his left side. So I changed the electrode position many times, but every position uh, the patient felt uh, left side stimulation. So uh, my residents uh, said that, uh, doctor, uh, there may be anatomical variation. So uh, maybe pain fibers are not crossing. So uh, try at the right side. And I did uh, from the right side, but the patient felt left side pain. I again tried from the left side, but always the stimulations are on the left side. So I stopped and did not do the uh, lesion. And this is very interesting. Uh, do you have any comments? I thank you for sharing that. Uh, you know, I too have had these same cases. Uh, so I have not had the experience you have of 500, but, you know, in 100, maybe 10% of cases, I will feel the stimulation on the other side of the body. Um, I too have had cases where I've tried to move the electrode. I did not think to do what you did and check the other side. That is a very smart idea. Um, but, um, you know, in those situations, you know, I wish I had kept some better notes of those cases, but since some of those I went ahead and if the electrode looked like it was in the anatomical part of the spinothalamic tract, I did go ahead and make a lesion. And some of them uh, improved. Um, so I don't know why that happens. I think, uh, like you say, maybe it is that there are some patients that have uncrossed, uh, uncrossed fibers of the spinothalamic tract. The other thing that I would think, uh, the, the other thing that is I've been, I thought about is, you know, is the electrode too dorsally? We are stimulating the dorsal columns, or is it, um, uh, or, you know, are there other, re or is it because the patient has a lot of numbness on one side of the body that we're trying to treat? So I don't know, but I have definitely had that experience and uh, it is confusing and sometimes frustrating when that, when that has happened to me. Um, do you have non-cancer patients? Uh, I had three non-cancer patients. I did cordotomy mm -hmm. and uh, one patient I uh, repeated after two years and uh, he was really happy uh, to have cordotomy because I did every procedure, uh, spinal cord stimulation, dorsal root ganglion, uh, pulse tarif. I did every procedure, but uh, he had uh, left uh, hip pain and uh, he had a traffic accident and he was paraplegic. He is still alive and 
is still paraplegic. And it, must, it was my first non-cancer patient. And he was really happy, but uh, after two years, uh, his pain recurred. So I did the second lesion. And the other two is also paraplegic patients yeah. and had really severe pain. So I did chordotomy and it's a very uh, safe procedure, as you mentioned it. Uh, so uh, I don't know why uh, in the world uh, it's not uh, largely used procedure, but it's really safe if you do it uh, in a right technique. So there is no problem, but uh, it would not be done under uh, CT guidance. It's uh, it's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. I don't advise uh, doing uh, under CT guidance. But uh, all the pain books written in uh, after two thousand till now always writes the CT guidance, but. Right? It's a very uh, it, it must not be done under uh, CT guidance. It is uh, uh, it is very nice. You know, uh, there was a uh, a doctor in uh, England. I had talked to uh, Doctor Sharma. Also, feels very strongly about the said the uh, X ray guidance. Uh, may I ask, you feel the CT is not needed or it is, no, it's, uh, it, it is bad in some way? No, it's a very, very bad procedure because uh, you can't know how deep your electrode within the cord. Mm. Uh, so uh, spinal cord is not stable. So mm. it moves. Uh, you may uh, see your patient. So uh, you can't know... Uh, they look the uh, odontoid uh, process, uh, but I have some pictures that uh, the electrode is in the right place, but the uh, spinal cord is uh, the other side. <laughs> Sorry, uh, so Professor. The, yes. I, I think you said uh, CT guidance is not a good procedure, but you yes. mean the opposite, I think. Is that right? No, 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 no. It's uh, it's not C good technique. CT guidance. It's no, no. It's not CT guidance. Oh, C did, did I said CT guidance? Yeah. <laughs> I mean fluoroscopy. You okay? Mean, uh, opposite. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, sorry. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Oh. Uh, I, I mean fluoroscopic guidance uh, yeah. because uh, you can't see how deep your electrode or uh, where it, where it is, uh, anterior or posterior part of the spinal cord. You are saying so, the same uh, thing. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Okay. yes, yes. You are saying the same thing. Yeah. May I ask one question, sir? Yes. What uh, temperatures and how long have you used huh. and how many lesions, please? Yes. Uh, I'm uh, doing uh, 80 degrees. 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and 30 seconds. Because okay. uh, when you begin uh, lesioning, the patient feels pain. So 10 seconds uh, can be affordable. So uh, it's not a problem. Then the other uh, 20 and 30 uh, seconds uh, lesioning uh, is not really painful. Uh, so uh, I'm doing uh, only 10, 20, and 30 uh, seconds, 80 degrees. Uh, you are using uh, very long time. 90? Uh, two, two, mm -hmm. times, two times 60 seconds. Maybe I can do less. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that. I will try. Uh, maybe shortening the time. 
Sorry, I want the question. I want to ask a question. Uh, Ashwin, do you pop the dura? Do you uh, insert the dura two times, or you change the direction inside of the dura? I uh, poke the dura once, uh, most times, and then I try to change it when it's inside the dura by just moving the needle. Yes. So, thank you. I think uh, we thank have you, a... professors. Uh, I want to read uh, one or two comments from the chat part. Uh, Ertan Sevin uh, from our clinic. Uh, he says, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, I hope we have the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face scientific discussion in my country. It means Turkey. It is my country. I would very much like to see In Izmir. Izmir. <laughs> and uh, Ayhan Kanat has a question. Uh, what is the dis disadvantage of transdiscal chordotomy? You said that anterior spinal artery may occur, but lateral uh, lateral transdiscal approach may not damage this artery. It is a good point. Uh, you know, I think Roslan went from one side, entered, and crossed, and then entered the spinal cord on the other side. Uh, to be honest, I don't know why he didn't just go in from this side and end on the same side. But I think maybe in the crossing, that uh, that is where he felt the risk could come. But you are right. I don't have any experience with the transdiscal approach, um, so you know I, I I can't answer your question hundred percent. Thank you, sir. Uh, I don't see any other comments. Uh, Mr. Suju, do you have any other words? Yeah, uh, Dr. Ashwin gave an excellent lecture today. He shared his experiences honestly and in detail. He spoke slowly and clearly, giving a speech that was impossible not to understand. We were lucky today. Uh, thank you again so much. It is really kind, and I thank you all for uh, uh, you know for all the papers that have come from your area and uh, your all experience. And I do hope we can meet in person sometime. Good night. Good yeah, afternoon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank, Thank you again. Thank, Thank you a lot. Thank you. Okay, good evening.